Okay? The, uh, the thingy has woken up. It's all, obviously, it's a recurring problem. That thingy overheats. Time is ticking, so I'm going to speed up a bit, but uh, other sources of conflicts is, of course, scarce resources. <laughs> if there's not a lot of resources, then we begin to fight. I would like this, you would like that. Who's going to get what? So it's also a, co a co source of conflict, and that goes all the way through the organization from an interpersonal level to between departments. Oh, they get all the resources, and we make all the money, and oh, wine, 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 you know. Status inconsistencies, someone who thinks they have a lot of status but might not. So there are a lot of sources of conflicts, but they can also be grouped into interpersonal, intergroup, <coughs> and uh, inter, intra, intergroup. So we have between groups fighting because we have different ideas, different perspectives, but also internally in a, in a group. And of course, between organizations. It's always nicer to have an external enemy to fight. That sort of makes people come together. It's a classical political thing. If you have problems on the home front, then you just start a war with a neighboring country and everyone lines up. So processes. This is a process. Yep. Um, then I have to <coughs> that this, this was a conflict in the organization and mm. interorganizational conflict is across the organization. It's not with an external uh, organization. Sorry. It says in some, yeah, it's... Okay, then I didn't misunderstand. No, I'm just being unclear. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, this is the, sort of the process you've been through in the, uh, in the group forming process. You start by forming, sort of come up with the common goals, then there's a storming phase, conflicts, negotiation, who's doing what. Then you develop norms, Consensus, team spirit, we are on the same page, and then you perform, and then, of course, you turn in your assignment, the group dissolves, and you adjourn the project. Those are the five stages in a group. But you can also have task, different types of task independency. This is sort of the, the regular production flow, sequential task. One does one thing, the next one does another thing. But we might also have pool performance. Each of us deliver a bit of it, but it doesn't really change the overall performance. Uh, sort of the overall growth performance is the sum, but the re reciprocal performance is quite different because here each of the tasks is depending on a person that actually performs well. So if, if one performs badly, it's going to reflect on all of it. So there's some differences here in the, in the, in the way that we can organize and the effect it's going to have on performance. <coughs> Sorry. The job characteristics model simply says something about how job characteristics combined with psychological states forms a given outcome. So if we, have, we like to have skill variety and task identity, that leads into experience and meaningfulness of work, and again, that leads to high motivation. The same goes for autonomy. Experience again, responsibility, good for work outcome, gives us high performance, and feedback. So these are things that we can build into the way that we organize work. Sometimes there's a tendency that we reduce skill variety and we also reduce the variation in the way we do things, and that's because we want performance. We want people to perform the best, so we think that it's a good thing to have very little skill variety. Unfortunately, in the, in the end, it reduces motivation. So there's pros and cons here. It goes in both directions. And we have reward systems. I am particularly interested in a reward system and performance management. Because it's one of those things that really, really influence behavior. You measure something, and you're going to get that behavior. And there's also always going to be a backside to this behavior, the dark side of performance management. So basically, you have inputs from the organizational members. They give their time. They give their effort. They use their education. And that buys into performance efficiency. And again, that gives you some outcomes. You get pay. You get job security. You get benefits. Of course, job satisfaction, autonomy again. But it's the motivation equation we're looking at here. Um, this is a basic understanding of, of human needs. You have this uh, physiological needs. I need a cave. I need a crash pad. Safety needs. There's no tigers around. 
belongingness, I'm part of group, esteem, and in the end, we often have self-actualization. I am fulfilling my full potential. Most in our society, we're looking at the top of this pyramid. Most people don't have problems with the physiological needs. <laughs> but there are different motivational theories we can look at. There's sort of expectancy theory. What do you expect? What is the association between a form of performance and outcome? It needs to be high. And there's need theories in the sense that people should be able to satisfy their needs by simply performing at a high level. And equity theory, if I go into a group, I expect that things are equal. Outcomes should be distributed according to the way we perform. It's the way that we work. It's an organization. Of course, there's goal setting theory that the outcomes should be linked to attainment of goals. Very short. Because uh, yeah, very short. Actually, in the book, it says that goal setting theory is about that specific and difficult goals motivate people more. Mm. It doesn't mention anything about attainment or outcomes, actually. Oh, uh, so that was just a question about that. <coughs> Yeah, experts. this is uh, the challenge with the, yeah, uh, with, with the toolbox that we have that is basically based on, um, on the previous um, the books that we had. But you, as we wrote in the, in, the, in the introduction and description of the course, this is the toolbox basically that we aim for. Uh, about the goal setting theory, then you should be aware of what's the content of it within, yeah, when you read it in this definition. Um, yeah. So we basically have three types of goal, uh, controls. Of course, there's the input stage where we feed forward control and we anticipate what's going on. There's a conversion stage. We're also able to control the current uh, content. And there's the output in the end. And that's three ways that we can control the process. Um, and in the end, through the feedback. Often when we look at bureaucratic systems, there's a tendency that we don't have feed forward control in the input stage. We do something and we transmit it to the next link in, link in the chain and they sort of look at it. So you have a time lag and if something's wrong, they return it to the sender. So in some situation, feed forward control is the best thing. There's also three types of organizational control systems we have output control, which are the basic financial measures. We are on schedule. We're using the things, the amount of resources. Then there's the behavioral control, um, which means that you have your manager very close to you. So, so there's an element of proximity here. If you work and as an independent, uh, and not, in, not in, as an independent, if you work in a job where you don't have a, a managers or group in your immediate vicinity, you're more likely to be incentivized by the financial measures and the goals that are set for you, because that's what you measure at. You don't meet a manager, you don't often meet a colleague to respond to these simple output controls. Any performance management system we have has a tendency to focus on the output and reduce the amount of behavioral control. It's, if you look at a big organization like a bank where you have <coughs> multiple branch offices, it's a way for the controlling part of the, the strategic part of the organization to control individuals. You set individual performance goals, which means that they reduce the amount of behavioral control they think. Actually what's needed is often, even though you have strict KPI, strict financial measures, the behavioral control is very important to make people perform. Any place where people are gathered in a group, there are elements of clan control. That's what we always reduce or sort of return to. There's a group of people, we have values, we have norms. Yep. How it differs? The difference between. Well, this is, I think, you and me. Um, how, how management by objectives differ from. Okay, yeah, management by objectives is by one thing defined by how the objectives um, are set. So normally when you have MBO, that's when you define the objectives together with your employees. So for example, at a university, we would every year set our goals for the coming year. 
how many publications are we going to do, how much money we're going to earn, etc. And then we're being controlled by output in the end. So when we make our yearly report, then we have to state, did we actually achieve the goals that we set? But management by objectives is that we try to set the objectives for the year together with our manager. That's one of the definitions if you look into the literature. Yeah, so that will actually inform or influence my behavior. So we have people practices. The very simple theory is, uh, is the theory X and Y. The theory X, everyone is lazy. And I treat my employees that they're lazy and they need to be kicked a bit to make sure that they actually perform. Or the other group, or the other perspective, the other end is that everyone is not inherently lazy. They want to do their job, they want to do it well. So this gives rise to two different, completely different ways of, of leading and motivating your employees. We still see a bit of theory X, <laughs> which I think is quite interesting. I've never seen, I do a lot of organizational studies I've never met Theory X people. I've met managers who talked about their employees like Theory X people. But actually when you interview and you get close to people and you observe, they're just obsessed with their jobs. They want to do the best and they like what they actually do. But the managers, they sometimes see something different. Or you're obsessed with your job but you don't really do what I'm telling you to. So they're categorized as Theory X and you go into very close people management and you set up very, very strict goals. So. We're getting to the end here. Hofstede has been looking at national cultures. Basically, there are a number of dimensions. Masculinity, driven by competition. There's uncertainty, avoidance. Yeah? In the book, it doesn't say masculinity. It says achievement orientation. And femininity is replaced by nurturing orientation. Yeah. So how come you changed it to masculinity and femininity? That's a good question. The original Hofstede is actually these. So I'm not sure why they use that. Yeah. Do you repeat the question? Sorry. They use different uh, phrases uh, oh, for masculinity. Okay. So the masculinity and femininity we're going to focus on in this mm. yeah. Yeah. exam, and yeah. not the achievement orientated and nurturing mm. orientated. It's the same, same, but it's it's just different yeah. ways of phrasing it. The uncertainty avoidance is that. How, how do you deal with the fact that you really can't plan for the future? Do you do or you spend a lot of energy actually planning or avoiding things? And individualism. Do we go for collective or individual approach and power distance? And I think the interesting part is that I just pulled some data from Denmark, Sweden and Germany. The good thing and the interesting thing about this hot status <laughs> dimension is that they're quite different. Power distance between Denmark, Sweden and, and Denmark we are very low in power distance in Denmark. It means that you can have employees which are at the bottom make big decisions and, and you can approach your manager and it doesn't feel awkward. That probably wouldn't happen in the same sense in Sweden or in Germany. They like more structure in, in Sweden and they're more hierarchy. We're sort of same on individualism, not a, not a big slight difference, but masculinity. Denmark, we are like Sweden, very feminine, actually. Germany, on the other hand, goal-oriented, beyond belief. Uncertainty avoidance, we don't really care if there's a danger of an earthquake. Well, shit happens, it's sort of the Danish approach. But in Germany, you would plan for the worst, you would make sure that, okay, there is going to be an earthquake, so we might as well plan for it in advance. We don't have the same view. And long-term orientation, there seems to be some sort of connection between these two. We don't look to the future. We sort of act in the present, where in Germany there's a tendency that you really plan ahead. The long strategic light, 10, 15 years ahead. So there are differences. And they also translate into how would you, how would you work in an organization like that. When we have people from Asia working in Danish organization, they used to a larger power distance. And when they become managers, they sometimes feel it intimidating that you have employees regular employees that just face up to them. They don't take an order, they just say, well, what do you mean by that? And they start questioning the manager. That's unheard of in all other cultures. But that's because we have so low power distance. We don't really relate to that. So big differences. Last one, Shine's cultural model. Yeah.
No, you're, you're supposed to understand the, the five different sort of concepts and what it means to be on either uh, end of the scale. Like, for example, that you have high uncertainty. Yeah. You're supposed to also have collectivism and so on. You're supposed to also have... You know, be on the right side and the other. Nope, no, no. These, they don't go together in that sense. They are five different dimensions and they vary individually depending on culture. So it doesn't mean that if you're low on power distance, as you see here, you're not low on individualism. There might be a connection between low on power distance and that you're very individual. But there are differences where you have countries which are, have slightly higher power distance and still are, are, are quite individual. U.S., for instance. You still have a hierarchy in the United States, but you're still very individual. So it's not that these five dimensions move in the same direction. They don't correlate. Last one, Shine's model of organizational culture. It's sort of a classic model where you say that when I go into an organization, what do I look for? At least there are three levels of an organizational culture. There are sort of the artifacts. I go in, I can see the artifacts. This, and when you look at this room, then you see there are this, this nice thing that I can stand behind and assert my authority. Other cultures might even lift it up so I can look down on the students and feel elevated. So it says something about relationship, about the culture. It also allows us to look at the values. What do they value in a culture? And often there are some basic underlying assumptions. These are unconscious. unconscious. And a classic trick question is that what are the underlying basic assumptions? And these are very difficult to, un uh, to decode because they are unconscious. You can go into an organization and say, well, I've seen the artifacts and I also understand some of the values. So the basic underlying assumptions are very clearly stated. <coughs> I mean, uh, if you go to a very different culture and you're an expert, for example, you're an anthropologist, I don't know how to say that in English. Anyway, then you might have a pretty good idea of some basic underlying assumptions, I would say. For example, we assume here in Denmark that Sunday is usually a day off, right? Which but is you, you underemphasized my point by saying, if you're an anthropologist, then you have a tool set which allows you to understand the basic underlying assumption. My point is that... The basic underlying assumption, they don't come easy. But of course, if you're an anthropologist, you spend five years studying this stuff. So you're able to uncover through a lot of research that there might be a connection between some uh, artifacts, some values, and some underlying assumptions. But because they're unconscious, you can't just go into an organization and, uh, and, and make a questionnaire and interview something. So what are the uh, underlying assumptions you have about X, Y, Z? And people say, oh, I don't know anything. It's difficult to decode. It needs a lot of work. So that's just the, the simple point about Shines. Yeah? I can we download the new slides? The yeah, sure. Screen. They'll be available in one hour. Thank you. There's no, not, no big difference, it's just a few yeah. extra. But the extra thing's really good. I'm oh, sorry. So, you're up. Yeah?